So, in this lecture we are going to discuss about the scanning probe microscopy. This microscopic techniques have been developed late 1980s and early 1990s and there are a lot of development taken place even after 2000. So, we are going to discuss only three important methods in this connection. Stanley microscopic techniques, atom force microscopic technique and near field scanning optical microscopic technique. So, as you understand scanning probe means there is a probe which is going to scan a surface of a material and these techniques are widely used for study of surfaces both external and internal surfaces. The first two techniques that is scanning trailing microscopy and the atom force microscopy both are used for the surface imaging of the material. On the other hand near field scanning optical microscopic technique is used for both surface and also internal surfaces of the material. What I mean to say is that the external and internal surfaces both can be imaged using the scanning near field scanning optical microscopic. So, most important uh, technique which is used for near field scanning optical microscopy is the laser confocal microscopy and this is gaining more importance over the time scale that is can give us information regarding the structure of the internal surface. Initially it was used for biological specimens nowadays people are using it for material science application also. So, in this lecture we are going to discuss one by one these three techniques like there is STM, AFM and NSOM and part of the NSOM is basically LCM that is laser confocal microscopy. So, let us first discuss about the scanning tunneling microscopy. As you understand it is a scanning technique. So, therefore, like any scanning electron microscope uh, you have probably have used it there is a raster which makes the tip of this microscope or the probe of the microscope to scan of the surface and tunneling is basically coming from the tunneling of currents. So, let us first see history of it. It was discovered uh, quite some time back about 30 years back by two scientists Henrich Werner and Binning at the IBM labs in US and for this discovery immediately after a few years they got Nobel prize in 1986 for this discovery along with another stalwart in the microscopic technique that is Hans Ruska. So, Ruska actually finally had the discovery of transmission electron microscopy. So, he along with these two scientists Rohrer and Binning, uh, Binning received the Nobel prize in 1986 for the discovery. The central figure shows this machine which these two scientists made uh, at the IBM labs. So, before discussing about the scanning tunneling microscopy let me just talk about something about tunneling. The concept of tunneling came after the, uh, the, the advent of quantum mechanics. As we know the if we take a small tip very fine tip of the diameter of suppose few nanometers 1 to 2 nanometers and bring close to a material surface. And then if you apply a small bias voltage V to the tip because of this small bias voltage there will be electrical field generated and this electrical field will lead to tunneling of electrons from the tip to the sample, sample surface and this tunneling of electron can result into tunneling current. This is well known in the literature that is this is the reason in fact this current depends on the height of the barrier and uh, it has been found that this height of the barrier this is the tip here you can see and this is a sample. So, therefore, once the tip is bought close to the sample and a small voltage basically bias voltage applied between the sample and the tip and then there will be tunneling of current like this or electrons like this. And it has been found that the height barrier that is the distance between the tip and the sample surface this is a strong function of average work function of the tip and the sample. So, therefore, obviously tip material has to be have has to have very low work function material normally tungsten is used for that very fine tips tungsten uh, tip which is oriented along 110 is used for certain tunneling. 
In fact, this same tungsten strip is used for the fake electron guns which you discussed for transmission electron microscopes. So, so, therefore, this concept of tunneling can be used for imaging the surfaces of a material. Let us see how it is done. So, here I am showing an atomic scale view. On the left side of this picture is the STM tip consisting of atomic atoms of the material which is uh, used to make this STM tip normally tungsten and then there is a surface. So, therefore, when the tip is bought very close to the surface as I have already told there and there is a small bias voltage applied that is tunneling of electron from tip to the sample surface. And this height h which is known as a barrier for tunneling is directly proportional to the, the average work function of the STM tip and the surface. Now, so therefore, if we do some kind of arrangement to scan this tip on a sample surface and depending on this height tunneling current will vary. So, therefore, we can use this tunneling current variation to image the surface of the material. There are other ways of doing that also which I will discuss subsequently. Now, this is on the right side of the picture that is shown in a schematic uh, video which is made by making many number of images. So, as you see there is a small uh, tip here at the top consisting of several atoms, several atoms and several hundreds of atoms and the surface and this is scanning either here actually sample is shown to be scanning or moving by CNC plate or CNC device at a very control velocity and the distance between the tip and the sample surface is kept constant. Uh, depending on the atoms the height atom plane or atomic positions uh, the height of this barrier will change. As you see the green atoms or the blue atoms at a lower height than the green atoms. So, therefore, the tunneling current will vary and once we obtain this kind of information and store it we can plot it as a function of spatial variable and we can get the image. So, this is the basically the principle of scanning tunneling microscope. This was well known even after the discovery of, of the quantum mechanics and other theories came up in 19, uh, 1920s and even 1920s, 1930s but the actual device making took a long time only in 1980s the actual device could be made because of the preparation of fine tip at the same time controlling this movement of the tip because tip needs to be brought to the very close to the sample surface for tunneling to happen. So, ideally tunneling uh, the STM tip is very much pointed. In fact, it should be as pointed as that it will contain 1 to 2 atoms at the end and relatively very low arc functions. So, what is used is basically H tungsten crystals they are ideal and in fact these H tungsten crystals which are oriented along 110 direction this is 110 direction 110 direction of the tungsten crystal. These are also used as a field emitters as I saw it in a field emission gun and so therefore by so there are a lot of uh, what is called um, uh, complex mechanism by the STM works which I am not going to discuss, but I will discuss about the basic things of the principles of the scanning transmission electron microscopy and scanning tunneling microscopy and also some applications. So, as you know this uh, this is actually the device the way it looks like schematically the sample surface there is a tungsten tip and then there are attachment here and which will make this device to move on x y plane and this the tunneling voltage applied across the tank tip and the sample and we measure the current. So, and atomistically this can be shown like this again I am showing several times this thing so that it can be clear to you there is a tip here which is a positively biased as compared to the sample surface and because of that current electron will flow from the sample at surface to the tip and current will flow opposite directions. A tunneling current is basically actually exponentially varies as proportional to the distance and thus a feedback loop thus a higher feedback loop a tip can be maintained at a constant distance from the sample surface or it can be even bring close or to see the variation of the tunneling current. So, there are obviously there are two ways of operating it if the tunneling current is kept constant suppose between the tip and the sample surface uh, the z position of the tip must be moved up and down depends on the sample surface as you see sample surface is very rough here it varies. So, therefore, 
the as the tip uh, turning current is constant, so to maintain this constant current in the tunneling current in the tip, one needs to bring the tip closer or la at a longer distance depends on the sample atom positions on the sample surface. So, this movement is normally recorded, the movement of the tip can be recorded as it is moving on the sample surface and then it can be plotted and on a sample surface on a, on a basically raster mode it can be plotted and it will give us a topographic image. This is the first mechanism by which, so in the first case we kept the tunneling current, tunneling current constant and move the tip, tip is moved up and down to keep it constant and the position of the tip is then used to plot uh, to obtain a topographic image. This is the first or the A we can say mechanism of scanning turning microscope. Another way we can do is that we can keep the Z position of the tip constant that is the distance of the tip from this one of the sample surface can be kept constant and tunneling current obviously will change depending on the surface configuration. So, whenever the atoms are closer to the tip there will be more tunneling current, atoms are close are wider to the tip there will be less tunneling current. So, therefore, if this changes in the tunneling current is recorded and then if you plot the tunneling current variation as a function of spatial variable x and y or z then basically we can get a topographic image. So, this is called B. So, in this case z is kept constant and that is distance between the tip and the sample surface at a particular position and then tunneling current, tunneling current is measured it will change as a function of sample position and then this is plotted ITC is plotted as a function of spatial variables to obtain a topographic image. So, this is very simple this are all well known even long back, but discovery always takes time because of the implication because of the you know problem of integrating the whole instrument. So, and obviously as you understand the probe needs to be scanned or probe needs to be scanned actually on the sample surface this scanning is done by raster is similar to like SEM and each coordinate is can be recorded each coordinate of the sample uh, tip can be recorded on a on a computer just like that. So, whether you use A or B it does not matter all the positions are recorded and then values of the current or values of the distance of the of the, the movement of the tip can be recorded and whichever you want you can plot on the on the on a computer and get the image. So, this is basically the way these are the ways different ways a scanning tunneling microscope can be used and these are used normally. So, remember this requires the tunneling of electron therefore, the whole thing has to be kept under very high vacuum system. This is another problem second problem is that the sample must be conducting otherwise there will be no tunneling of current. So, these are the basically routine uh, problems one phase the sample is not conducting much there will be not much tunneling happening of the electron from the sample surface to the tip and because of that current flow will not happen and this, this microscope will not occur. Second important thing is that the, the, the whole system has to be kept on a ultra high vacuum and that makes the the process quite costly because you need a vacuum system attached to it. On a broad scale actually if you remove the if you increase the scale, so the, this will look like this the this scanning tip is controlled by PGO's electric scanner and nowadays very precisely controlled PGO scanner available and this tip is basically can be bought close or wider from the sample surface. As you understand the sample surface will be very rough there will be atoms are arranged in a differently order manner and in fact, there will be absorbed atoms sitting on the surface. So, all those things makes the sample surface very rough. So, the, uh, and then there is a feedback loop to control the if you want to keep this tip at a constant distance from the sample surface there is a feedback loop or and uh, you need a voltage amplifier also to amplify the whatever voltage is coming recorded. So, ability to precisely position the probe of an STM is possible only because of x y z PGO scanner and this x y z PGO electric scanners came long it took long time for it to be operational and uh, to make it be to made be used for this kind of microscope purpose. So, this kind of PGO electric scanner is always coupled to feedback regulator 
to keep the track of the tunneling current also precisely positioning the tip. So therefore we need several electronics for such a kind of device to run and this all become possible only when the technology has advanced sufficiently. So give you some examples and I am just taking example from the literature because we have uh, personally I know must I have not worked on STM and uh, some of our colleagues has but the images from the books are much better let us look at that. This is actually taken from uh, solid state physics book by Charles Kittel which is a standard book you can see this image available in black and white contrast. This is actually platinum atoms on a 1 1 1 plane. What you see is that hexagonal array of atoms 1 2 3 4 5 6 this is an hexagonal. So 1 1 1 plane a surface will be containing this kind of atomic element this is a central atom and this goes on repeating. So what you can see here this, this just goes on there is another one here like this. So it gives us very good content not even that these are actually images of atoms looks like but they are not as you can understand they are not actual images of the atoms they this is basically plot of the tunneling current as a function of the space. So this side suppose this is at a higher height so this will give us very small high tunneling current that is why it looks like a dark on the other hand these surfaces which are at deeper side which are looking like bright and what again the groups here looking like also darker darker means very uh, black color. So they lead to very small amount of tunneling current. So that is how we can actually generate images to show you another one this is for the nickel surface. See there is a distinct difference between nickel surface 111 surface nickel 111 and the platinum 111. In a platinum 111 you could see big atoms filling the whole space. Here you can see large gap between the rows of the atoms this is these are the rows of the atoms and this is again obtained from the same group meaning, meaning and the steward which they have done on in the when they are working in IBM labs. So these are the tips of the uh, these are the positions which are close to the tip of the scanning tunneling microscope that is why they are looking like very bright and blue on the other hand this surface is looking darker because they are at, a, at an angle and this is again looking dark, brighter depends on the obviously how the surface is aligned with respect to the tip. The surface are inclined they are not flat really at even at any scale surface will not be perfectly flat because the atoms atomic reconstructions takes place on the surface always. To give you another example which is from very recent work this is one of my collaborators professor A.P. Sai from Tokyo University from quasi crystal surfaces. So we know that quasi crystals are very you know new and very exotic materials people think about it also that even Nobel Prize for the discovery of quasi crystal was awarded uh, this year in uh, last year actually 2011 to Professor Dan Sedman for discovery of that. So this has become a big aspect of research nowadays. This is a scanning turning microscope image of the icosahedral uh, ALPDM and quasi crystals. Quasi crystals all are multiple element alloys. So what you see here is that five atom clusters here one two three four five or ten atom cluster like this you can see on the surface surface there are many such clusters here one they are one okay many many such clusters which are deemed to be present on this quasi crystal material. This is the atomic arrangement we really cannot say which atom is what but we can really say that on the surface of the quasi crystal also the same atomic arrangement is observed as in the bulk. So one can actually uh, see it while doing the STM remember to do this STM analysis we need to clean the surface. So any aluminum alloy will have very thin layer of aluminum oxide presence. So these samples are taken in ultra high vacuum and then they are sputtered using the argon gas to remove the whatever oxygen atom presence and this then the virgin surface is created which was then probed by the STM and images are taken. So therefore STM is obviously very costly equipment because you not only need a vacuum system and other things but also you need sputtering devices also for to study different metallic samples. And as I told you mostly the contact sample can be studying so metallic samples looks to be ideal for these conducting samples that is what they are done. Now 
uh, let me go to the next uh, the uh, surface probe technique that is called atomic force microscopy. As I told you the scanning tiling microscopic technique has its own problem like it cannot be used for non conducting samples, it cannot be used uh, for liquids or it can be used in normal atmosphere because you need to have tiling of currents that requires tiling of electron that requires vacuum system to be uh, very good and whole system to be kept under vacuum. So therefore these limitations led to the uh, discovery of another microscopic surface microscopic technique called atomic force microscopy. And this is again uh, based on the principle that if we have a very uh, fine tip attached with a cantilever beam and whenever this tip is brought close to the sample surface. So there will be atomic force uh, acting on the tip because of the uh, atoms which are present in the sample surface and depending on the force they are actually there can be repulsive or attractive forces which I will tell you depending on the distance between the tip and the, and the sample surface. So depending on these forces the tip can be going down or going up. So if we measure the tip position by using a laser beam that is if I have a laser beam falling on the tip surface and reflected back on a four a quadrant photo detector then I can precisely determine the tip height as it scans on the sample surface and then plot it just like it is STM and we can get a better image. Remember this does not require any vacuum system, this does not require you know the sample to be conducting because it depends on the atomic forces and this kind of atomic forces between the tip atoms at the tip that is this red color atoms and the sample atoms they depend on uh, the what is called distance between the tip and the atom it does not depend on whether sample is conducting, non conducting, insulating nothing. So this is the basically the idea. Now I will discuss you in detail how does it work. Well AFM brings a probe, probe very close to the close proximal surface that is the tip and uh, this force is then is detected by a deflecting spring. Actually it is not a deflecting it is a cantilever you can see this is a big cantilever beam which is attached to, to the microscope and this force is detected. Now forces between the probe tip that is this tip and the sample are sensed uh, to control the distance between the tip and the sample. So as you know if you have two atoms suppose the force versus distance between the atom can be plotted like this and this is how the force versus distance curve vary. So whenever the atoms are very close to each other there will be repulsive forces okay. Whenever atoms are far apart from each other there will be attractive forces all you know that. So therefore depending on the closeness of the tip to the sample surfaces the forces between the atoms of the tip and the sample will vary whether repulsive type or, or maybe attractive type and this can be used to operate the, this kind of microscope AFM in different modes. The one of the mode is called contact mode, other one is called non-contact mode. So we will discuss one by one this contact mode and non-contact mode but I hope you have understood what is the basic mechanism. Basic mechanism is the forces between the atoms of the surface and the tip, atom and the tips. So that is those are the probes. Now before that let me just tell you how it is. It is again discovered by Binney, Gower and the quartet at Stanford. Remember after discovery of STM Binney moved to the Stanford University and it requires a cantilever beam, a tip, sample surface, laser beam and obviously you need a photo detector. All of this I have shown you at the first slide and the tips actually can be different type. This is a normal tip as we see it is just like a tetrahedron or you can have a super tip like a one tip and another one is attached to that or you can have an ultra lever tip which is 3 micron tall and these are all obtained from J Paul lever from Caltech and all this image is available in this website you can see that. So tip manufacturing is a big thing it is normally done using a very complex process like dipping in electrode and, and looking at it in the microscope subsequently every time you dip it some small amount of the material is getting corroded uh, this this kind of uh, from this kind of tips and that is how we can fine it up to the atomic level. Remember the tip is a very fine of the order of few maybe 1 nanometer or less so that there are very few number of atoms present in the tip. 
Well, as I said, there are two modes of operation. One is called contact, other one is called non-contact. Contact mode is corresponding to repulsive, and non-contact mode is called as attractive force. If you can be clear from this plot, force versus distance, whenever two atoms are brought close to each other, and uh, as we know that the force versus distance, if the atoms are even impinging on each other, will be very high, and then this force comes down, and then there is optimum distance where force is the minimum and then if we move the atom far apart from each other again force increases and it becomes constant after some time and remains there. And obviously up beyond a certain distance there will be no force of attraction repulsion whatever between the two atoms that is how the, the forces vary and this basically called was this can be obtained from any uh, chemi physics or chemistry textbook you can see that. And so therefore, whenever the probe or the tip is very close to the sample surface, the distance are very short, the forces will be repulsive in nature as you can see here, repulsive in nature or whenever the distance will be large, the force will be attractive in nature and keratin cantilever can be used to both measure the both the attractive force or the repulsive force in different modes. So, if we measure the repulsive force is called a contact mode. If we measure the repulsive, the attractive force is called non-contact mode. This is also known as tapping mode. I'll discuss in detail. So, in a contact mode, where the short range interaction of between the interatomic forces are very important, tip is normally 5 to 20 nanometer diameter radius and 20 to 10 to 25 nanometer micron height. Okay, and the cantilever is approximately 50 to 400 micron long and cantilevers are normally very low stiffness because they needs to be you know going up and down deform actually, but it cannot deform the sample surface because if it is the sample surface in contact mode sample surface will get deformed and then you do not actually detect exactly what is that sample surface. Tip can scan the surface either the tip or the specimen can be moved by piezoelectric positioning system and detector system can measure the reflection of the tip as its contacts make the contact of the sample surface because you are bringing the tip to the very close to the sample surface. So, there will be contact and then it will be deflected and the deflected can be measured by say laser beam. So, uh, as I said here also there are two ways of doing so one is called constant force that means, if you suppose want to have the constant force between the sample surface and the tip uh, to be maintained then the, there will be feedback loop which will keep this constant force. Uh, on between the sample and the, and the tip, uh, but to keep this, uh, this constant force the sample till has to deflect more when the distance is higher between the tip and the sample surface. When distance is smaller that the attractive force will be sorry whenever distance is higher the attractive force is uh, repulsive force will be a uh, little less and when the distance is close repulsive force will be high. So, depending on that you can detect the tip deflection and in the jet directions and then plot it later on to get an image or you can actually have a constant height. So, no feedback system is really used when the sample roughness is small higher scan rate as possible here also and in this case the tip is kept as constant height from sample surface and force actually varies and that force can be lead to deflection of the tip and that can be measured to plot. Well, in attractive mode that is called non-contact mode it is called also tapping mode this is used for the interact normally attractive forces to interact the sample with the tip. It operates within the van der Waal radii of the atoms. We know there is a van der Waal force of attractions, and this attraction happens when the radii of the atom is within the van der Waal force of attractions limits. And in this case, actually, the cantilever resonates, cantilever actually oscillates near its resonant frequency normally 200 kilowatts to improve its resonance. Basically, if I have a tip like this, I just keep a tap so that it resonates or it is do like this, and once it does it it measure the long range forces that is why it is called a tapping mode. It has many advantage than the contact mode no lateral forces will act on this on the tip because whenever tip is very close to the sample surface there will be lateral forces which can act also other than the this vertical forces uh, here there will be no lateral force but distance is higher this is non contact. So, non destructive. So, it does not lead to any contamination of the sample it does not lead to deformation of the sample also. So, this is basically suitable for all kinds of soft material. And the other mode which is contact mode is basically suitable for the hard materials because even if the sample uh, tip hits the sample surface there will be no deformation activities on the sample surface which will not change the material surface 
or the chemistry of the surface because of contamination or the uh, change on this atoms on the sample surface. So, uh, the attractive force is basically uh, as I just now said is basically depends on the van der Waal forces that so distance should be maintained such that the van der Waal forces uh, ready of the atoms actually uh, becomes comparable with the tip distance. Now, how is the force actually vary? Let me just tell you in a, in a simple slide like this. So, how do we actually measure? As you know in AFM actually one can measure the force versus distance plot also. So, this is the sample position, this is the force cantilever force and uh, these are the different position A, B, C, D, E and I am showing you the position of the tip. As you see tip is close to the uh, coming close to the sample surface at position A, but not at course, course so therefore, the force is very constant and whenever tip is touching the sample surface or very close sample surface tip gets buoyant. So, the force started dropping or rather it will be start is taking on this curve which is the rising curve and the sample at position C force is very high and whenever uh, the this is what is happening is the engagement whenever tip comes down and, and basically hits the sample surface. If you want retraction that is disengagement from the sample surface then again it will be going C D E say E D C B A. So, this is the position C which is that is exactly at the contact point D is basically it has again gone down much. So, it gone up so the force has decreased this E as it has decreased A means it has got up and this is the set point here. So, therefore, depending on the kind of disengagement and engagement the forces on the cantilever beam varies. varies. How the forces are measured? Well, this obviously is very important aspect. Suppose this is the XYZ scanner and this is the sample that means sample scans on the, uh, the tip does not move but sample scans and as the tips basically goes down the sample surface as okay, this is tip trajectory the forces acting on the tip will be varying. So, therefore, that deflection on the tip will also vary and if you have a laser beam following the sample at tip surface and then depending on the position of the tip that it is deflected more or less because of attraction or whatever force attractive repulsive force on this with the sample surface this the laser beam will precisely detect the sample deflection on the of the cantilever tip and this will go the back to the sensor sensor actually consists to a four quadrant system is just like this a b c d so if the laser beam hits a b c d any positions it can be detected very precisely so cantilever beam is designed with a very low spring cost as i said so that is easy to bend and very sensitive to the force a laser is focused to reflect this of the cantilever beam there is focused on the cantilever surface and so that it can be reflected back the sensor and position of the beam of the sensor measure the reflection of the cantilever beam and this it turn can give us the value of the force. Obviously, this has to be doing the rastering just like ACM or STM and uh, these are the images taken from nano device corporation which, which are making this, uh, this instruments. Another one is taken from Stephanie Rose from biophysics department of Boston University in Germany and as you see here the as this is the tip cantilever and this is the tip which uh, I told you that I will show you and uh, here you have showing the same thing this is a tip this is a cantilever this is a tip and this is attached to the microscope and laser beam falls on this, uh, this the tip uh, and as the tip deflects more it, it can sense the positions of the tip by using that and this is how it is done and tip uh, make a rastering here just like this which is shown here as is rasters on the sample surface and every time it position can be detected by using a CNC device or piezoelectric device rather and the tip position can also be detected by this. If you store all the data in a computer that on you can plot the position of the uh, deflection of the tip as a function of the distance or the function of the spatial coordinates and get the image. This is used many purposes like digital image uh, for the topographical surface or uh, this can be used to determine the roughness of a sur surface sample or to measure the thickness of a crystal growth layer. In fact, this is mostly done to measure the topographical sample surface. This can be done to the level of atomic resolution that is Armstrong level. So, all the actual, actually people are able to get resolution of the order of 1 Armstrong. So, you can see the atoms actually on the sample surface which I have shown you 
uh, which I am going to show you also uh, in this and I have shown you in case of STM. Now, this can be also used for non conductive surfaces like proteins and DNS as I showed you. This can also be used to study dynamical behavior of living and fixed shells. Remember, this is not exhaustive, applications are keep on coming as the technique is getting used more and more. So, therefore, if you want to really know about the real application, one needs to look at the literature available in the different journals. Topography is obviously done, this is again right side of his topography image. 2.5 and 2.5 nanometer cross this is 2.5 nanometer 2.5 nanometer distance of pyrolytic graphite graphite ok. In fact, you know the graphene is basically graphite graphene is basically prepared for pyrolytic graphite graphite this is graphite and uh, bumps are represent topographic atomic configuration ok these are the ones while coloring reflects the lateral forces of the tip ok. There is a coloring scheme this is how the force varies and scan direction was right to left this is the way. This is taken again from the uh, naval research laboratories of US they have uh, obtained these images. So, this can be used for high resolution imaging for the contact mode the uh, contact mode actually lead to very good resolution image, but it can damage and also can measure basically frictional forces also. A non contact mode, mode you have a lower resolutions, but no resistance to the, the uh, sample tapping mode as I said the, the tip can be tapped the better resolution, but minimal damage to the sample surface. Again to show you some of the uh, images which we have taken recently for NACL crystals uh, which were basically ball mill to see the defect structure on the sample surface. These are not to the atomic resolution images, but will really tell us the images on the sample surface ok. So, as you see here this is the initial NACL sample with the clear steps which can be again seen on a topographic plot. If you deform it by ball milling 4 hours and 8 hours you can 4 hours you can see the steps created on the sample surface damages are done in 8 hours even the surface steps are much finer and you can even come to you can see this this kind of small undulation created on sample surfaces. Important one is a laser confocal microscopy. But let me tell you the basic principle first. All of you know that the in optical microscope resolution is basically governed by the wavelength, wavelength of the light, and as you know, the, the resolution is normally obtained to about 300 nanometers, and it is very difficult to go down because the optical uh, microscope uses light, normal light. But in near field scanning optical microscopy, we can beat the resolution limit. And not only that, we can even scan the surfaces, we can look at the internal surfaces of the many things. In fact, in the medical or in the biological uh, research, one can image the inside structure of artery or vein by using these microscopes. And for material science, we are learning it how to use it. I will show you some example how it can be used, or uh, there are a lot of you know potential for this technique to be used for the material science applications. This technique or uh, actually is called NO, NSOM near field scanning optical microscope is we use a sub wavelength aperture ok. Normally we as I told you in a uh, transmission electron microscope or even uh, the other microscopy techniques that uh, scanning transmission uh, scanning transmission electron microscope also use apertures and aperture is nothing but a plate in a small hole is present and it can be used to select a particular beam in a, a, a transmission electron microscope. In this case we use a sub wavelength aperture and this is about 200 to 20 nanometers is the diameter and this can be placed very close proximity to the sample surface that is the actual challenge. Actually it can be placed very close means of the order of 10 some nanometer like 10, 20 nanometers and then if we allow the light to pass through this aperture light passing through the aperture will remain collimated because it is very small size for the distance of the order of one uh, at, uh, aperture diameter, aperture diameter is of the order of 20 to 200 nanometers and if aperture diameter is maintained in the near field position and then it is scanned on the sample surface. So, image can be reconstructed point by point with a special resolution limited by the aperture not by the wavelength of the light because the aperture is smaller than the wavelength of the light here. Normally, in the light of microscope, optical microscopy, wavelength of the light is 
a couple of 100 nanometers that is 300 to 400 nanometers, but here aperture is less than the size of that. So, if we keep the aperture in the near field region that is very near to the close to the sample surface, the actually the resolution of these microscopes will depend on the aperture size not on the wavelength. That is how we beat the, the resolution uh, determined by the uh, wavelength of the light. So, this has increased or uh, this has led to the rapid change of the you know study of the different kind of material by using the optical microscopy just by using a near field aperture. I hope this is clear from this picture. So, what is here actually you have a tapered aperture as you see here which is kept close to the sample surface and then this is a polycrystalline sample obviously and you pass a light beam to that and then these apertures can be actually scanned over the sample surface and if you scan the aperture light beam also be scanning the sample surface and then this is the, the constructed image which is diffraction limited diffraction limited resolution image basically and this can be obtained in a far field lens and then plotted. Now, these are all done digitally obviously, because one can use reconstruct the image using computers. This has been possible because of one major discovery. So, as you see here in the earlier picture, this tip uh, the tapered uh, the tip of uh, the NOSM, tapered tip of the NOSM is basically what is dictates resolution. So, this was done by developed uh, by tapered optical fiber probe was developed by Betis and uh, Troutman in 1991 and tapered optical fibers are fabricated from single mode optical fiber using a commercially available micro pipette puller with a focused carbon dioxide laser as a heat source. This aperture is formed by coating the tapered fiber with a high reflectivity material that is aluminum or silver via standard thermal operation. So, you can see there actually this is the AG coated on a tapered optical fiber and AG actually increases reflectivity. Reflectivity should be very high because you are using optical light and, uh, and then uh, this is actually high numerical aperture optical microscopy objective. So, this is detect uh, whatever is reconstructed after this light beam passes through the sample surface and that is what is done uh, in a uh, near field optical microscope. So, instead of a light one can use a laser beam as you can understand there are optical lasers available light laser beams which are coming in the optical wavelengths that can be used that is why it is called laser confocal microscopy. And because the aperture is kept the near uh, field uh, that is why it is called confocal and this is how it is done really there is a laser beam which comes with fiber optics and then this is the real aperture which is tapered one the sample and there is a collection optics and there is a detection optics. As with STM probe is this is also a raster using a piezoelectric device this is means this probe is nothing but tapered optical fiber that is rastered using a piezoelectric device because that movement needs to be controlled very precisely. To give you some idea how it can be used uh, these are all taken from different literature this is again from professor Dr. Hans Jurgen, but the from the MPIP this is Max Planck Institute NIMS joint international lab. This is basically ironing liquid micro drop stained with fluorescent dye red color staying on a soft PDMS surface which is a green color. You can clearly see the clarity of the image and when one can see the, uh, the tapered nature here of this uh, of the liquid drop. So, that is actually increases our capability to uh, image even small liquid drops present on the, uh, the surfaces uh, of any material. Another example of this is corrosion surface which is a very new this is published just few months back by Sanchez Tovar et al in corrosion science and as you see is that this is actually copper surface at 75 degrees after the certain kind of corrosion test called JRA and you can see in fact that the corroded regions in the sample surface the, the black color regions are the sample surface. Remember this is an optical microscopic image using confocal microscope it is not a scanning electron microscopic image. So, the clarity and the uh, this is actually the micron distance is 40, 56 and this is a large scale and the resolution is much better than the normal optical microscopic image. So, one can actually probe this kind of effects and as I said in the, the lecture that the new new applications are 
coming into picture as people started learning these techniques more and more. So, one can use it more and more. To compare these three different techniques FM, STM and the NSOM, I like to tell you three things. In all these three techniques, resolution is largely dependent on the probe size, okay, that is the tip size and in case of AFM, STM the tip size, in case of NSOM this is the aperture size. STM requires a conductive specimen, AFM and NSOM does not require, do not require and both of these can be used in air, vacuum or liquids, but STM needs to be used only in vacuum. AFM physically contact the specimen by contact mode, but STM and NSOM does not. So, AFM in the, in the contact mode can damage the specimen surface contaminate, but STM and NSOM will not. Well, there are many other techniques in this world has come up also. I will just I will tell you several ones, but I will not discuss each of these techniques. First one is lateral force microscopy is called LFM. In this case, fictional forces can be measured by twisting or sideways forces on the cantilever. Again, it is basically a type of AFM. You can also have magnetic force microscopy MFM. Uh, this is again popular for the magnetic material. If you have a tip is magnetic, it detects the magnetic fields or measure the magnetic properties of the sample. Or you can also have electrolytic force microscopy is called EFM in which electrically charged PT tip, the platinum tip def detects the electric fields or measure the dielectric and the electrostatic properties of the sample. In fact, people can do chemical force microscopy also. The chemical chemically functionalized tip in AFM can interact with the molecules on sample surface giving information about the bond stems. And I just discussed about the near field optical microscopy. I discussed about one of the technique like laser confocal, there are many others available. So, in this technique also probe technique in which small apertures are scanned very close sample and probe is a quartz fiber, it is a major discovery uh, made in 1991, pulled to a sharp point and coated with aluminum or silver to give a cyber length aperture. And there are uh, many such interesting uh, applications for each of techniques available which one can actually get from literature.